So we're sitting here with Tammy Benjamin, who is considered the is the youngest victim of the Southside rapist. We're here to That's interview her, and, and, and she's going to tell her story, which is pretty fascinating. It's so funny what I remember very clearly and, and maybe the details that have stuck with me over the years. The, the night that this happened, um, that day I was at a high school hockey game. I was 14 and a, and a freshman in high school. And uh, yeah, so in the afternoon I went to, late afternoon I went to a fresh, uh, a hockey game, high school hockey game and my freshman boyfriend and his dad uh, took me to that game and they they're the ones who drove me home that day or night that boyfriend walked me to the door and I unlocked the door with my key uh, because that was always a question was the door unlocked when I got got to the door and I, I remember getting my key out and unlocking it and you know he walked in walked into my front uh, front room the living room and said goodbye and he left so that night I was supposed to go babysit um, for a family that was that was supposed to pick me up at a certain time. And I don't remember what time it was, but I think I had about an hour maybe to get ready. So change my clothes and pack up a bag. And uh, I left the front door open. Um, I was, you know, preparing to leave and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't, that, that they weren't waiting for me and I could just look out and see them waiting for me to pick to pick me up to babysit. So I went into my room. I think I changed my clothes, packed up a bag of schoolwork and whatever I wanted to take over there for the night. And I walked out of my bedroom. My bedroom light was still on because when I walked out, and if you, I don't know if you, I've ever mentioned anywhere, if it's ever recorded anywhere, at our, we had this little tiny, um, two bedroom city house. So from any point in the house, if you peeked your head out the door, you could probably see the front door. So walking out of my bedroom, kind of peeked around the hallway. I mean, started to kind of just walk around that hallway into the living room to put my stuff down. And I saw him standing there. And just as soon as I saw him, he physically turned me around and his first words, were you expecting anyone home? And I said, no, uh, I was, I was in shock. I thought my first thought was, this has got to be a joke or somebody that I knew. Um, we were kind of a, a little bit of a social house, you know, people, um, would come and go kind of, I knew my dad was out of town. He was deer hunting. My mom was kind of out of town. She was in Cahokia, Illinois for the night. Not the night, but for the evening. She was um, making my costume for the high school musical <laughs> in uh, Oklahoma. And uh, I was in the dance chorus. But uh, so, you know, I'm think I'm trying to think to myself, this could be a number of people. It, was it my brother who's 10 years older than me and fit the build and description? kind of, you know, very vaguely. And was it one of my brother's friends? And oh my God, that that's kind of what I thought. I was like, this is, this is my brother's friend and he's trying to get in the house. He's in trouble. He stopped at our house. He needed help with something. Or this was um, my neighbors who I knew really well. I So in a split second, 12 people popped into my head. Who could this be? Thought it was, absolutely thought I was safe until he said, are you expecting anyone home? So I kind of felt like he was holding something against me, but it turns out that was probably just his hand. Uh, again, this tiny little house, um, there wasn't far to go, maybe three feet before he pushed me back into my bedroom. The light was on, so he knew that that light switch was right there. He flipped it off and um, I immediately thought, <laughs> okay, I know what's happening here. I'm in trouble. And this guy might be okay because he doesn't want me to see his face. So, you know, he, the only time I really got a good glimpse of his face was that initial, you know, face to face. And he had, you know, spun me around pretty quickly. So, uh, 
that's that was kind of my thought too. It was like, real quick, I thought I might be safe. He doesn't want to kill me. Uh, so I said, hey, take whatever you want. Um, I and and right away he said, you have what I want or something along those lines. What I want, you have. So then I was like, well, God, okay. What am I <laughs> So I'm going to interrupt you real quick, Tammy. Yeah. At the time, yeah. you're 14 years old, and you can you give us your physical uh, bill at the time? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was probably 100 pounds, maybe. How tall were um, you? 5'3". Okay. No, five, I just four. wanted to set the, set the stage, and then, you know, Dennis is, or is the, the Dennis Rabbit's, what, six foot? What would you describe his build as? How much significantly bigger was he? Yeah, so I couldn't tell exactly how tall he was because from every angle that I tried to size him up, he was never upright. You know okay. what I mean? Like crouching through the house, I, you know, I noticed he was kind of bent over in the dark room where we struggled. I, there was no way I could tell how tall he was. And he had a pretty medium build. Just super generic build. So he's got so, you in yeah. the bedroom at this point. He pulls yeah, you back yeah. into the bedroom. Yeah. So he pushes me back in there, and and now I know I'm in trouble. So I had to quickly kind of decide what I was going to do. Like, and I'm scared because now I know what he's there for. And you know, I'm young. I'm a kid. This is before I've ever had any kind of sexual encounter. So the thought was terrifying me that that he wanted to rape me. And I'd almost rather him kill me at that point. I'm thinking like, right. okay, how am I going to handle this? So I realized I could take him. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was thinking like, I'm full of rage right now because that, that fear turned into like fury quickly. So I thought, what have I got to lose? You know, let me see where I can take this guy. And um, I, I kind of felt him. I'm like, what? what's going to happen here? I realized that he is completely nervous. I can tell, I can smell it on him, right? Like we're excited. I have no idea, but he's also got a lot of clothing on like a sweatshirt, layers, sweatpants that were kind of loose, gloves, glo like work gloves that have little beads on them. He's trying everything that he can to get me down onto the bed. So I just start kicking. I just you know, I'm trying to scream. He's got his hand over my mouth. I don't know at what point, but I did bite him pretty hard on his hand. I think that's probably what upset him the most. So I think that came a little bit later. But so basically, that's when this struggle ensued, a fight. And, you know, I think had I had he really been serious, he was, he, you know, he was trying to do whatever he could to get his pants down and you know it was just a lot to coordinate and he was not <laughs> able to do all that well said <laughs> a lot to coordinate that's, <laughs> that's a lot what's going on lately. yeah right i so, mean on a good day hard yeah. to get all that so is he yeah, so striking you at all or do you start the striking when oh yeah you struggle, no, does would... he strike you or do you right away just start kicking and anything you right can? Yeah, no, it was me. I was starting to struggle more, I think, because he was so distracted with trying to get my clothes off and get his clothes off, which he did. I mean, I was I ended up completely naked it, yeah. pretty early on, but he and I had a belt on. I, so through that whole thing, I was trying to fight him, but he got the belt off. He got the pants down. He got everything off. The, the, the trick was getting his clothes off because I was <laughs> no help to him. In that <laughs> So with all, with all of that, you know, and he he could not even he wasn't even close to being able to perform anything. So right. he tried everything. He tried to get his face everywhere he could. He tried to get it. You know, he was he, he I think maybe if he could have, he would have. Um, but he had made every every position. So I was face down at one point. I was face up through a lot of it. He was trying to get my head down there like. You know, but nothing was going, nothing was happening for him. Sorry to say, buddy, but. You no, know, I saw an interview with him. Director of security for Anheuser-Busch got a camera into his jail and he interviewed him. And he says that he always would go the other way when someone put up a fight. And he asked specifically about you 
and he said, I did everything I could to fight her off and get the hell out of there. So that's not exactly true. He, it sounded like he, you put up a good fight and he ran away right away, but that isn't true. So you, you fought him for a little while, obviously. Oh, yeah. Oh, obviously, yeah. I mean, I was, I mean, the fight went on. I don't know how long it actually lasted. That's a really good question. At least, <clears throat> at least 15 minutes. Oh, it could my have been gosh. Finished. No, I was waiting for I'm you to say sure four minutes. It, yeah, I thought, know? yeah. No. I'm not sure if it was 20 to 30, but it was at least 15 because all of that had to happen. There was a lot of negotiation going on. You know, several times he said he asked me to stop, stop stop fighting. fighting. Yeah, I think, you know, part of him might have been feeling kind of bad, but just because he was like, please stop, you know, like stop moving, stop doing this. And, you know, and it was it got violent. I mean was probably upset with himself. He couldn't get it up. I was fighting him off. He, at the... one point he had me on the ground, like st- stomping on me, like I was a bug trying to get me to stop moving. Like kicking? Yeah, like me. like stomping. Wow. Um, just to probably try to like slow me down. But I had like all this adrenaline, like I made up my mind that I wanted to send this guy packing. So this was just my goal. And I didn't get to a point where I thought he could stop me. And and maybe I thought I could get out. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I thought I could escape the room. But at one point during this long struggle, I pulled a necklace off of his neck and threw it. So he stop he tells me to stop or he says he's gonna stop and he says put your face down and do not look up so he gets up i put my face down and he got up and turned my bedroom light on and he's looking under the bed for that necklace he's looking all over the place and we have turned this room upside down like furniture everywhere (laughs) so then he says don't move and he leaves the room and i thought Oh, Jesus, let me get out of this room. But again, this house is so tiny. It's a trap. There's no way I'm going to get out and I'm naked. Where am I going to go? Like, I thought, I wonder if I could beat him. And as soon as I thought about just bolting for the door, he comes back in and he, and he turns the light back off and he had a knife. So I think. Now, is he bloodied at this time? Because he said you bloodied him. Oh, yeah. your, your face is still down, or do you... Uh, no, yeah, um, my face was kind of down. I'm kind of like, what, you know, what should I do? But he comes back, turns the light out, and I really didn't get a good look at him again. He had that knife, so then he's like, okay, now you're going to do what I say. I'm pretty sure he must have gotten that knife out of our kitchen. I don't really know. I feel like they didn't know if any knives were missing out of our house, because I don't think we really took good track of what we had. Yeah. But... Who does? Right. Like, which knife would it yeah, have been? Yeah, yeah. That was a steak knife with a knife. Yeah. knife. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows, but um, that's I'm, that's my assumption anyway. So I'm nervous came back right now still. I'm nervous, too. I'm, like, <laughs> freaking out listening to this. Yeah, this is way more. I, I didn't know that this fight went that long. No, I, I'm, I'm so, a... So I, you, you got us, because we're all nervous hearing this story. And it's oh. I'm getting angry, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I feel like... Well, we can talk about it later, but it's, it, at the end of the day, it was kind of anticlimactic. Like, okay, that happened. Oh, <laughs> was, oh really? Wait, well, the, I one, was so young. One of the like, interviews I just, that I did, or I, heard, I saw the interview I did see earlier, he said that most people just cave to him right away. He, he, they just fall right apart. And one of the stories he says he went into a south side house, went upstairs, asked the, the mother if anyone was home, and she said her daughter was in the basement. And she complied and brought him to the basement, and he raped the daughter. So they didn't know the same, the fight, like you learned to fight or told to fight. But, but anyway, that's Timmy, I wanna, kind of crazy. Timmy, I want to, that is crazy. I want to uh, touch on a word you used and see if you can expand on it, uh, negotiations. Tell us about right. negotiating with the South Side rapist. <laughs> and I wanted to, and to, to expound on that little question yeah, from the negotiations is what, kind of language are you using and be honest and what kind of because he says please so please to me is you know he's trying to be nice are you trying to be nice back are you are you what kind of language was it up and down like a roller coaster nice sometimes tell us about the negotiations yeah i think the real negotiations came when he when he had the knife and 
that ended up working out in my favor, thankfully, because I was like, okay, great. Now I really have, uh, I'm up against him and a knife now. What am I going to do? So I, at first I was like, okay, I have to be still. Now, part of the premise of me fighting him was he didn't have a weapon and I thought I could take him. Well, now he's armed. Uh, so he's got this knife and I, I was like, okay. Uh, I told him, okay, okay. So he can't get it up. He's still struggling to get his clothes off. And I decide while he's trying to get his clothes off that I'm going to kick him again. I'm going to do whatever I can. And I'm going to keep putting up this fight and struggle. And that went on and I would negotiate again after he would, you know, he would kind of get the upper hand again. I would say, okay, okay, I'm going to lay still. I'd lay still again, realize, nope, you still have the upper hand, girl. Uh, Go ahead and kick him again, you know? So I'm trying to kick him the balls. I'm trying to do whatever I can. And uh, I don't know, three or four times we went back and forth uh, with him saying, hold still or I'm going to kill you. Hold still. okay. Yeah. And I would say, okay. And this went back and forth three or four times, maybe five times uh, with the knife. And finally, I just broke that knife. He got it close to my neck. At one point, it was on my back. So he had me, he had his, I think his arm under my back, like uh, with the knife while he was trying to get his pants down or I don't know what he was doing, but the knife was on my back. Then he had the knife to my neck. And I think that's when I was like, oh, hell no. So I just pulled that knife away and just broke the blade right off. And probably Damn. within seconds, he said, okay, ma'am, I'm going to leave. <laughs> he, yeah, he called me ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did say he didn't know. No, that you were he, 14. Didn't. no he didn't. Right? He did not know you were 14. And you didn't fight like I a 14-year-old mean, either. He... Well, that could be argued. I was dumb enough to fight him, I think. And that's what it, and I'm not trying to say that in a negative way. I just think that I had 14 year old naivete. And that's what, I mean, I always talk about my dad. This could all be about my dad, a podcast about Steve Sirocco. <laughs> yeah. But, and buying that, yes. buying that cheap knife at Walmart. Yeah, that broke good thing. Really yeah. Yeah. Steve, Steve saved five dollars. <laughs> Steve saved five bucks and got a knife that worked out well. I mean, it was awesome. Now, did you cut yourself <laughs> breaking that knife? Did you, get, did, did you get cut doing that? I think I, I, I might have, but it wasn't anything that needed stitches or anything like that. But yeah, at that point, he, he, I think he might have looked for that necklace one more time, but basically he got his whatever he had off back on his body. And he said, uh, don't get up until I leave and wait. Something, I want to say it was two or three phrases. He gave me an instruction not to get up until he left the house. So. Do you leave the necklace behind? He sure did. Is that where they got the DNA or was there some blood? There was blood. I think there was blood and hair. It might have been. Okay, yeah, I there think was that's where they got the, the blood. Because he, he cut himself. You you cut him or he cut himself with a knife? Or how, how did he get cut? I mean, I actually don't know. I did a lot of scratching and caking and who knows, just a little abrasion could have... I really don't know where the blood came from. Did but, you get some um, good screams out during the, the, the whole time? Or do you always have your uh, <laughs> mouth muzzled? Or? Yeah, he, for a lot of it he did. So what what did you do once he left? And what was your first reaction after he you knew he was gone? I mean, there wasn't cell phones back in 1991. Um, and what was what were you feeling once he left? I mean, that's got to be incredible. Oh yeah, she right? just went and babysat. <laughs> yeah. got, her, oh got her bag and, and brought her bag, which she wanted yeah. to bring over to the babysitter. Did you end up babysitting? She called the babysitter. That's so funny. That you guys on the way? That's really. That's uh, funny that you said that. I wish that I could have. I honestly, that thought went through my mind at some point that night. Like, I did think, oh, man. They're not going to hire I'm, me again. <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm pissed did, at him, anyway. actually. I don't but want seriously, her to babysit again. Because seriously, though, what was, what so was your emotions after he left? And what was your next step? Um, JJ I think I was just, Sorry. I was so excited that he was gone. <laughs> I think I was, I was feeling really high on life immediately. Yeah. Like, holy shit you you, you did survived it. it so just to be sure i went and locked my door the first thing i did was run and lock the door and then i just went to the house phone and called 911 and 
I don't know who the 911 operator was, but she was amazing. Uh, and I have like a card from her and she came to visit me and I can't remember her name. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, that was a great experience. But right now our uh, 911 centers aren't getting a whole lot of love. <laughs> no, so that's nice to hear. Yeah. Well, I hate to hear that, but it was good. Uh, so they had somebody at the house within a couple of minutes, I think. I mean, actually, yeah, yeah. So somebody, somebody showed up within, I don't know, five or six minutes maybe. And then the next phone call I made right after I, um, I spoke to them was my dad's first wife and the mother of my brother and sister who I was really close with and they kind of lived with us um, off and on was lived down the street. And I was kind of close to her and I called her because she was just a few blocks away. So she walked over uh, with her boyfriend, Tim, or her friend, Tim. And, and yeah, so those, those were my phone of friends, 911, and my brother and sister's mom. And then I think an ambulance showed up. My poor brother, he was a city cop. He's retired now. We, we know him. We, we know, know Tony. Yeah. So he got, he heard, I think the way that it went was um, he heard the call on the radio with his address, you know, like his dad's address. So he had to hear that and then he headed over. I feel so bad about that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, a he, lot of, that, that probably was the fastest he's ever drove. Yeah, he wanted to be there. Um, <laughs> no no other place on earth than there. So wh when did your father find out? Pretty quickly, somebody must have called him pretty quickly. Maybe my brother. I'm sure. He got home that night. I don't know what town he was in, deer hunting somewhere rural Missouri, but you know, probably a couple hours drive. But he, he showed up, and my mom, who was in Cahokia, was losing her mind. So she kind <laughs> of found imagine. out what happened. Yeah. Somebody called her and my aunt. She was at my aunt's house making the costume, and then they showed up. Uh, the people I babysat for showed up. <laughs> yeah, late. Late. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. They didn't even get to go out. Yeah. That was a good reason not tremendous to go, story. I, I mean, that was um, not crazy. Good, but it sent chills up. Well, um, but one of the things that I want the listeners to realize is at this point in time, the Southside Rapist was not a household name as it became as you got older, correct? Correct. So you I didn't know, know about the Southside Rapist until what, till eight, till you were eighteen, I believe. Right. So Probably. Randy Sassinger had told me that he did not talk to you until you were eighteen years old. That's right. So was he your first contact when you? Oh my God, that might have been the Southside Rapist. Is that the first time you put that connection together, or did you put that connection together right when you started hearing about the Southside Rapist? No, I think it, I think it was all. Uh, I think it was Randy. I'm pretty sure. I I have a hard time with dates because, you know, again, I was 14. That was high school. I, the biggest thing, most important thing to me was to get on with my life. And this was already disruptive enough, so I wasn't trying to focus on it. I really wasn't. That's um, fair. I, I was interested in this guy being caught, of course. Uh, that was a priority for me, but I, I think for a long time, it was a focus. I was kind of hyper-focused on him getting caught and following the case with my dad. And then there was part of me that was like kind of giving up because other things were a little bit more important to me, like life and being a teenager. Right. And I think when Randy entered in my life, I was in college. I... I think I had just finished my, or started my freshman year, and I was in school in Chicago, so I wasn't even home for all of this to kind of see it unwind. Yeah, so as far as the investigation goes and how it got started, you definitely know more than I do. Okay. Did you talk to anybody, and it was an attempt rape, is what right. you would call that at the time, and a lot of times they don't get as much attention as a rape. Was there much contact with investigators between the time that it happened and the time that Randy talked to you? Yeah, I think there might have been. There was actually, there's probably more than I knew 
you know, being a minor, maybe they weren't interested terribly into talking to me, thinking that I wouldn't want to talk about it when I absolutely am totally comfortable talking about it. But if, if somebody interviewed me, I wanted to talk to me, which plenty of people did in the beginning, but after that, they may have just gone to my dad, you know, and said, Hey, here's what we got going on. My dad was always honest with me. I don't think he would have ever kept anything important from me, but as far as I know that, that time of my life was kind of a blur. I mean, it was blissful, so I didn't have to worry about all that stuff, but my dad probably worried about it more than I did. And I don't know, there, there's probably a little bit of pathology behind all that. It's probably not whatever happened in the interim. I'm kind of unaware of, but when Randy got on board, and Mark Kennedy, um, I was in college. Uh, I think the most contact I had with him was when, or both of them, was when I was home for the summer, my freshman year maybe. And uh, I was I was in contact with them a lot. I'm trying to crack the case, and that's when I right. became aware of Southside Rapist. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you said you had a hard time getting a look at his face. Did you ever get a good look at his face? I mean, yeah, I did. Uh, that first glimpse I did, but, you know, so I can't say he had a mask on. I can't say that I never saw him. So I guess it's subjective. I thought I got a pretty good look at him Wow! at the time. Powerful. I, was just, I looked at these guys while you were telling that story and it's just an amazing story that, it, and to me, it's a story about sometimes you just got to make up your mind and fight at five foot three, a hundred pounds at 14 years old. And I think you said something in the beginning that might have, and you tell me, but this isn't the guy, the first guy that's going to, you know, have sex with me. This is just not going to happen. Is that part of, was that part of your, your mentality? Uh, Yeah, I think so. Right. I mean, that was my mindset then. And I, that might somehow sort of explain why some people maybe not see this the same way that are older, more experienced you know, because I kind of think about what if that would happen now, you know, how would I feel? How much would I fight or whatever? But, you know, I don't know. I honestly don't know how I'd handle it. But, yeah, I was naive in a good way. And that meant a lot to me. And I was scared uh, and furious, you know. So if I had just laid there, that would be boring. I'd have no story <laughs> to tell. Well, I, I uh, <laughs> talked to you on the phone and you, it's amazing how well you've adapted or overcame this and you said you were just more more focused on just going to school and doing your homework and getting things done and, and being something now you're a nurse practitioner am i right mm-hmm. and so and you're also an auburn fan so i have family members who aren't going to be happy with that but that's okay <laughs> but no well, but that's i mean the, the amazing part about you is that you put it in your rearview mirror and you just kept going and, and you know you have a, a family and a husband and you been successful in your life. It seems like you were very well adjusted and just a salt of the earth kind well, of Oh, she won, lady. but I do have she one thing I want to touch on. Are you going to interrupt me like six times yeah, on this one too, or no? At least that was my run. I know, but can these I guys fight all the time, Tammy. Do you this mind is, if what, I we, this is what we deal with every show, and we're just trying to I get these I things out. I bet I could take them. Yeah, you probably yeah, yeah, ain't yeah, touch. Yeah, I ain't you. Right. Yeah, I have two questions. Can I get them in? Go ahead. Go ahead. First of all, does Tony know you could kick his ass? <laughs> Your brother Tony? Because obviously you could. But no, first... Uh, we read, I want to make sure this is not a rumor, but we read somewhere that you were interviewed and you'd be willing to visit Dennis Rabbit in the penitentiary and, and talk to him. And you wished him well in this quote, um, and that he gets straight with his life and this and that. So first of all, my question is, is that true? And second of all, that would be a very powerful thing too. I don't know. But do you remember yeah, saying that? I do. I mean, I remember being in court with him face to face and, you know, I don't want to be so dramatic. Like this is, we're talking about human beings, right? Like uh, this could have ended much worse um, and people have it much worse than I did. And I'm so grateful that it ended the way that it did where he didn't even knock me out and kind of just leave me there for my family to find me or even... Uh, made me in a way that I wouldn't remember or, you know, leave me to survive in a worse way. So from 
everything that happened, I walked away with like a clean bill of health and I was so grateful for that. And that won over everything. So I have never changed my mind about if it's ever a question, forgiveness, this person is mentally ill and this is how he manifests that he might be able to trick you into thinking something, you know, maybe try to be dominant in conversations or something, but he's, he's mentally ill and I forgave him immediately. I was upset, but I just wanted him caught. I didn't want it to happen to anyone else. That was my priority, but I did not have any energy in me to hate this person or want him dead or anything like that. Do you think and I still feel that way. Well, you went on to college. Where'd you go to college? You said you were in Chicago? Yeah, I went to Loyola. You know, I think it left me more of a an eager um, interest in crime and mental health and criminology and the, you know, what makes us all tick and how some people become so unstable that, that this happens. Mm -hmm. And it can happen to some people, but not others. And, you know, so so maybe that, I'm sure there's plenty of things that have changed because of that. Uh, I I have to, look, I, I really try to think about this and what's important when I tell the story. It's not just a cool story of survival or whatever, um, making a, an attempted rape that could have been worse. Um, but like, what do I wanna say? It's It's more about like, you need to lock your door and you do need to be aware of your surroundings. And yeah, I think the takeaway, although I'm not a super careful person, I, you know, to answer your question about how has it changed me, I don't feel like a badass because of it. Cause I feel just, we are, we're all vulnerable and um, even in our own homes. Uh, so that, you know, to be aware. And I think people like Dennis Rabbit, well, you know, he was kind of an amateur in my mind and something simple like fighting would have scared him off. And that might happen with other people too, you know, with other intruders or gosh, anybody in a parking lot, alley, whatever. Tammy, I'm going to, JJ mentioned you have children now. Do you have a daughter? Yeah, I have two daughters. One's 19, about, or about to be 19 and one is 16 and then a 14 year old son. With your daughters, A, did you tell them the story? And B, do you tell them if it ever happened to them, would you fight like a wild woman and, and win? What's your advice oh, to them? Yeah, yeah. I have told them the story several times. They ask me about it sometimes. Um, they have me tell their friends. It's like a cool party trick. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, at one time, I do tell them to make sure that they can, they know that they can fight, you know, um, that they're not going to do anything wrong by fighting, that there's something to be said for, you know, just kind of screaming your way out of a situation if you can. And, you know, something my dad always taught, here we go back to Steve Sirocco's podcast, uh, <laughs> I I was, <laughs> but he always taught me, you know, and, and I think that's pretty universal, like you never let anybody take you. Don't ever, don't ever get in somebody's car. And if they say, I'll kill you, you say, okay, fine, kill me and, and be okay with it. Be at peace. Somebody's going to kill you before you get in their car. That's just what you want to do. Um, so I've taught them that and I've taught them that it's okay to fight. You know, it's not, even if somebody has a weapon, it's okay. So I hope that answers your question. I don't, um, I don't expect, you know, I don't expect them to do anything like, or be disappointed if, if they didn't fight because it's, everybody's different. You know, I have one kid that I know that would fight and maybe the other two might not. Yeah, <laughs> it's a personal so thing. I really do think that it's a little personal and yeah, Hope. I think everybody's just going to handle themselves differently, different situations. Agreed. As you're dating people or now your husband, do you tell them this story? And do you tell them the story because it's interesting or do you tell them the story that 
if you fuck with me, <laughs> yeah. I'm we'll capable of taking out. your ass out. Yeah, there's going to be consequences. <laughs> or she just introduces, introduces him to her father. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's probably good. I will be honest with you. First of all, I didn't know I could say fuck because I wanted to say it a few times. But, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> my, my dad has never been the dad. You wouldn't believe this, but he's always been real docile with me. I think he might be scared of me a little bit. Yeah. He he has never questioned anything I've ever done or dated. <laughs> really? Really? That doesn't yeah. sound like Steve. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like he's the just Steve really, that I, knew. I think he's just old and he by that time he was just real tired. Done I don't fighting. think he's uh, yep. Yeah, growing up in a cop cop house um, was always very fun for me and it and it made me love, you know, investigation and uh, just police work in general and you know, my house was always full of a variety of policemen and women and um, lots of rape. <laughs> right. Yeah. Full of rapists. Rapists. Occasional, occasional rapists. Occasional rapists. Occasional rapists would stop by. <laughs> get his ass you know, beat. Take, get, get his, his ass, ass beat. Take his, his ass sorry ass out. That doesn't, like, I think, you know, what do they say? Like, the shoe, the shoemaker's children have the worst shoes. So my dad was the, the, the <laughs> That's interesting. Ramen like arson. That. My dad being the bomb and arson uh, commander, we did not have one smoke alarm in our house. Oh, my God. Oh, hey, yeah, that, we have to cut that out. We cannot put that yeah, out. Yeah. 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 Now, what are we going to do about the interruptions? <laughs> um, and so, I didn't know this was a comedy podcast. Yeah. So, um, I just have awesome. some friends in St. Louis. Um, did any of them help you through this situation? And, and, and we're hoping to have a lot of listeners. Is there anybody you want to... Send a shout out to one of your Corriezu buddies that might have helped you through all this drama. Oh yeah, so that's probably, you know, I, I kind of talked about how I just kind of wanted to get on with my life, and that was very true. Like I couldn't wait to just be normal again, and I think I took that whole week off of school because, you know, my mom and dad were trying to tell me that you might be ready, but they're not. So. I, you know, a P, I, I got so much support. Um, people were at my house all the time and they were bringing me goodies and flowers and cards and uh, just general support. Um, people were coming out of the woodworks. People I barely knew were stopping by. And that is truly what kind of probably got me through it the most. That's awesome. <laughs> um, Anybody you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, I think one of the very my whole my whole high school and my high school principal sister Sheila uh all the faculty at Koryezu was extremely um valuable to me at that time to help me kind of cope with uh stuff I probably didn't even know I was trying to get through um my family of course uh and one person that really helped me a lot uh this is kind of a cool story was a a woman that was a teacher at the grade school that I went to, her name was Robin, and um, I won't drop her last name because I didn't get permission. I didn't even think about this until you just asked, but she was a teacher at St. Gabriel, and I didn't know her that well because she wasn't my teacher. She was a first grade teacher, and I you know, just graduated St. Gabriel. I just knew, kind of knew of her, but she came into my life at that time and she helped me through all of this because she had experienced it herself. She was, wow. um, she had an intruder, uh, experience and it was terrifying, terrifying. Her story was, it still haunts me. Um, so she right away made sure she made contact with me and got permission from my dad to kind of come in and talk to me. And I think I spent almost every day with her that she had free for probably a year or more anytime um, she was going somewhere she took me with her uh, I, at some point my parents I slept on the couch for a long time in my living room just because that bedroom was kind of yeah a crime scene for a little while and then I just didn't really want to go in there but eventually uh, Robin took me away for a night and I came back and my room was rearranged and redone and new curtains and bedding and all that good stuff. So she was a big part of my life and a huge reason why I coped so well because I saw her go through it. And she has a great story to tell too, by the way. Wow. Oh. 
Right. I get it. Actually, Randy was, we talked to Randy a couple of days ago, and he said he thought that some of the detectives uh, treated you poorly. So he thought that it might have affected you more than, than you're letting on. Yeah, I don't think I let it affect me too much. And I do know that, you know, my dad and my mom, and, and there were other people, I'm sure, kind of prepared me for that, that I had to be ready to be questioned about a lot of stuff that yeah. was going to be uncomfortable. And to me, that wasn't so bad. Like, I, I got it. I understand police work. And I, I get that that, you know, and I was cooperative, of course. I let them know I wasn't shutting down or anything whenever they would ask me something like that. But it did happen. I mean, but more uncomfortable stuff. I mean, I had to do a rape kit. I mean, you know, that was uncomfortable. Yeah. It, you know, it was my dad's friends that were, like, collecting that stuff. So I kind of felt stupid. That was, like, wow. that was worse than being questioned. But right. <laughs> I was up for it. I was like, you know, whatever it takes to rule people out and, you know, potentially rule someone else in, that's... He was relentless. He worked night and day on this case. On his own time. And he, yeah, a lot of his own time. He actually was kind of getting fought by the sex crime division because he wasn't a part of sex crimes. But the story he told is incredible and in how much he worked. I mean, he worked early morning to late at night riding these neighborhoods. And he was like a... And yes, Randy was phenomenal, this whole thing. He was very sensitive. He knew my situation was coming out of, I was away at school and I was, we were essentially working on this case together with me being in Chicago. And at some point I was in Europe and he would still call me, <laughs> I'd, you know, answer the phone. It's, it's your police friend again <laughs> on the phone in, in my dorm in Italy. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, Randy was pretty amazing. He had a way to, um, he was like a bulldog. Um, he would he would show up and at my convenience, meet me wherever I was at. If, you know, if I was out with friends, he would meet me there. If I was babysitting, he would meet me there uh, to talk, to chat, to ask questions, to give me updates. You know, in a way I was probably a little dismissive and I feel bad for that because I wasn't giving up. I think I just was thinking I don't have any power in catching this guy. And yeah. I told you everything that I possibly could. Uh, I don't know why you keep coming back to talk to me. But again, I, in hindsight, I realized that's good police work. That's someone who cares. And he was doing the best job um, that anybody could possibly imagine. And he made it happen um so i probably i would just i look forward to hearing his um take on it all and how he's doing and what his feelings are about everything and i know there were there was a lot of i don't know there were a lot of politics involved and yes. probably a lot of roadblocks unfortunately to, to prevent him from being caught sooner maybe <clears throat> or to making randy's job harder and i you know, I hate that for him, but I would love to find out more about that. I don't know that I need to know more about um, Dennis Rabbit or or anything, but yeah, I'd just like to know how Randy's doing. And he's doing great. Uh, he's doing really yeah. good. John's got a question, real quick. Hey, Tammy, this is producer John. Um, I read that you were one of the few uh, uh, victims that was in the courtroom when he was sentenced. How how important was that? to you to, to be there to see them? Um, yeah, it was important. I wanted to be there. It was, uh, I did it for a lot of reasons. I wanted to celebrate the hard work that was done to catch him. And um, that was no small feat, of course. Um, really to kind of honor my family and friends who helped me through it all and but to kind of honor the system and that's probably loaded but the um that this worked the way that it did and that i had the opportunity i didn't want to pass that up i wanted to take advantage of um that opportunity and you know i don't really remember what i said but um you know, I also had the opportunity to talk to him and to let him know that not that it mattered, but, you know, I was over it and I was glad he was caught. So we talked.
talking about this. It's not just about telling a scary story. It's about choosing to be assertive in life and not just in saving your own life or preventing yourself from harm or something. It's just about being assertive. And that's what I tried to kind of get across to my kids. And if anybody wants to hear the story and they're like, oh, you're so strong. Well, no, I mean, anyone, anyone physically could be strong in a relatively in a situation like that with adrenaline or whatever. But I think it's about making a decision that puts you ahead and the recalling, getting back to what you said, recalling the incident, going through the motions and each minute and kind of trying to replay it all just helps me remember that and maybe helps me tell the story in a way that people walk away with that sort of message is it has nothing to do with strength. It has, I was a tiny little thing scared out of my mind, but it was about putting myself first in that situation. Cause you're a survivor. Basically you just described yourself that you're a survivor in, in life. Hit it huggy. <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. Oh, it's a pleasure, and good luck with the podcast. You guys are awesome. Thank you. We'll, we'll have you back yeah. on. Yeah. Yes, I would love it. I love <laughs> it. I would love to geek out on St. Louis Prime. With